Sci-Fi Christian Screening Room. I'm Ben DeBono. I'm Ben Kirkwald. And I think this is episode 8. I'm not entirely sure, but we just finished watching Eraserhead. Yep. My fourth time I think I've seen this movie. Uh -huh. Your first, your yep. very first introduction to David Lynch. I think you have a lot of thoughts. I do. Uh, <laughs> I can't wait to hear them. I was kind of uh, trying to gauge your reaction while we were watching it, and I, I, I think I, I might know where you land. But but we'll see. But first, uh, you've brought a, uh, a, very a wonderful special. beer here. So this is, and you brought one for each of us. This is I, Dogfish yeah. Head 120 Minute IPA, which is very hard to find. Right. Except uh, for today, apparently. Well, we found it three times. I mean, yeah. I've been looking for this beer for two or three years now. Right. And then three times in the last month. I've been able to find it. Yeah, they just shipped Between it out to Minnesota. Us, found all of it. Yeah, they're like, oh, I guess we'll give those Minnesota guys. So it's 120 minutes. It's supposed to be aged. Um, Which is unusual for an IPA. Right. Up to 10 years is what Which, they say. Uh, it's crazy. And it just gets better and better and better. And I think, apparently, uh, I had one. They come in, They came in a four pack, so I, you, I drank one. Back in January, and the other three are gonna uh, stick around in their case for apparently up to ten years. Yeah, I guess I'm and, trying to find an ABV. I know it's high. Uh, it's like twelve percent or yeah, something. Yeah, it's no fourteen. It's like a wine. Holy crap! So drink slowly. Well, that's the you know a high alcoholic get smashed beer is maybe the perfect beer for talking about a movie. Yeah, like maybe about three of these. Right think. before um, you start to understand it. Right. So if you ever find Dogfish Head, 120 minute, um, it's it it's like it. 12 bucks for a bottle like this. Right, it's, it's not cheap. Totally worth it. Yes, uh, I have a fun little anecdote since we're sitting here talking about classic movies. I can't remember if I've told you this already. I might have told you this, but it'll be new to the people listening anyway. Um, so where I'm sitting at work these days, I'm kind of like five feet away from the help desk guys. Sure. And uh, one of them is on the phone about a week and a half ago, and I'm only hearing half of the conversation, but I suddenly realize that the conversation he's having is he's, you know, waiting for something to process. I don't know what he's on the phone about, but they yeah. had some downtime. So I start talking about movies. I kind of perk up because I like movies. Mm -hmm. And the guy, the help desk guy, uh, says, well, I mainly like the old classics. And now I really perk up. Have I told you this? Yes. Okay, it's good. It's good. I, I really perk up because I love classic movies, of course. Like, wow, a kindred spirit. And the next words out of his mouth, I swear to God, are Ace Ventura is one of my favorites. And just my hopes went, you know. Just, Never going no, to be no. talking to him ever again. And how sad is it that, I mean, this guy's probably like 23-ish, 24 and for, for the generation, you know, people like five, six, seven years younger than us, Ace mm -hmm. Ventura is in the classic movie realm. Well, and, well, you think about a, a couple of years Jim ago. Jim Carrey talks out of his ass. That's <laughs> funny. Uh, <laughs> doesn't make it not funny. Uh, <laughs> that's true, but I don't think it's going to go down as like <laughs> something that's studied generations from now. No, and I think you had the same opinion about, uh, you found like a book list, like top 10 books of all time or top 20 books. Right. And almost all of them were written in the 20th century. Oh yeah, yeah, those ones that show up. And any, any, uh, the dead giveaway for a top book list is if you see Harry Potter on it. Right. Like, Harry Potter's fun, I have nothing against Harry Potter, I have... Uh, plenty against Harry Potter fans, but Harry Potter is not Shakespeare, and so the, that, that's your dead giveaway for greatest books of all time. Does Harry Potter show up on the list? And if the answer is yes, uh, then, then you should not take that list seriously. But you should take lists seriously that contain David Lynch as one of the great directors. Now, you made a comment as we stopped that you said he was only famous to people like me. Right. That's not quite true mm, okay okay so uh, a couple of points uh first twin peaks series huge hit in the 90s huge huge hit 
Uh, but even more interesting, David Lynch turned down an offer to direct The Return of the Jedi. So, you could have almost had the guy who ju uh, directed the movie we just watched doing yeah. Ewoks and Death Stars and, and all Thank God he didn't, right? Oh, I don't know. I mean, Return of the Jedi, I, I love it, but it's the weakest of the trilogy. I, I'd be very curious to see what a David Lynch uh, Return of the Jedi is. So I love Eraserhead. I have a feeling you don't. So let's hear your initial thoughts. What did you think of Eraserhead? Um, so I knew we had talked about the fact that it's a surrealist movie. Yes. And it's just bizarre and out there and I was prepared for that and then it was way more surreal and bizarre than I had ever <laughs> anticipated in my wildest dreams. Oh come on, it, uh, it's not that far out there. I can show you stuff way, way worse yeah, than Yeah, let's original. never watch one of those. Okay. Uh, I, I was trying to piece it together. I was trying to... Right. Like, okay, this is art, trying to figure out how this all fits together. Is this like Memento where it's not told in order? Is this like, like how is how is everything all connected? And then at the end, I couldn't figure out how it was all connected it to each other. It didn't connect for you. Well, I was trying to figure out if, like, is this a dream sequence? Is this a dream sequence? Is this... Maybe the whole thing is a dream sequence. Right, you know, the... Uh, I, it took me a long time to come to terms with the fact that the baby was like an alien. That took a while. <laughs> it kind of threw you for a loop. And then the wart guy just shows up randomly for five seconds. Are you talking about the man of the planet? Yeah. Yeah, okay. I'm just making sure well, we're all on the same page about who the wart guy is. Well, there's only one guy with warts. Well, the baby has, has kind of warts at one yeah, point. Yeah, but then those go away magically without any resolution to that. Well, it's sick. It just, right. Because he fed it some worm thing. Yeah, that'll do it. Right. I just... Nothing made sense, and it was very frustrating to watch. It's a frustrating experience. It was a frustrating experience. I felt like... It, uh, if you didn't tell me... I don't know. So, David Lynch appears to be famous. Good for him. But right. I feel like if this was just some unknown thing that you... I would absolutely chalk this up as artistic BS, like me looking at some scribbles on a piece of paper in an art museum worth two million dollars when it's scribbles on a piece of paper. And that's okay. how I feel about this movie I, I understand. Please I've been, I want to be convinced otherwise. I, I think I, I can do it. I think I can do it. But, okay. uh, well, I don't think I can convi convince you to like it. But I can convince you... I can appreciate. You can appreciate it. I can appreciate. Yes. Now, this was David Lynch's first movie. And it made uh, it, it. It wasn't like a big mainstream hit, but it you know back in the day they there was a lot of midnight movies and whatnot for weird, bizarre, out there stuff. Okay. Uh, and this this that's really where it made its mark. Was on the midnight movie circuit, and, and then the rest is history. Now David Lynch is huge name, huge. Apparently. Um. So did you find it funny at all? Uh. Yeah, there was a couple of comical parts. I, I think it's hilarious I the thought, whole way through. I thought when he like is trying, like he like taps her on the shoulder, like when they're sleeping in bed, trying to like, yeah, hey, do you wanna? And she's like, no, no, right. I don't. Yes. Um. Just, I thought the dad was funny. The the meet the whole meet the parents section is just right. Meet it's like, really. it's just so weird. It's so bizarre. Like, yeah. Like your mom kissing your boyfriend's neck. Right, right. There's just, yeah. The little chickens. The little chickens. Right. That was pretty funny. Yeah, there's there's so much. I mean, it's a very funny movie in my opinion. Uh, so, I'll tell you the part I think I can convince you on and the part I can't. So, the part I can't is all the little details. Like, there's so much in this movie that it either just, it's weird and it kind of works for you. Or it doesn't, like right. the fact that there's mounds of dirt on the nightstands. I don't know what that means, but it's just so weird. It just hits me in the right way, and it's funny. It's like there's just a mound of dirt, and then there's a picture of an atomic bomb going off over it. And a know, lot of those things change throughout the movie. Yes, they, they change, yeah, okay. and they're different. And 
Yeah, and so there's this whole bizarre thing that that's going on with the makeup of this movie with all these little details that I, I just find hilarious and and really weird and they hit me in the right way. Right. Uh, and either that stuff's going to hit you or it's not. And I think that that's kind of... Uh, David Lynch's movies are very subjective in that sense, and especially in terms of your appreciation for them. His movies operate out of dream logic. Uh, for example, The Woman in the Radiator, he dreamed that and then woke up the next morning and wrote it into the screenplay. So there you have it. It's like, what does it mean? And David Lynch is a very subconscious director, so he puts a lot of stuff into his films where he's either not willing to say this is what this means or he even doesn't know quite what it means but it hits him in a particular way and so he, you know it, it's a lot of that stuff so that is or isn't going to work for you right. and uh, I don't think that that's something that I can convince you on very much so maybe a little bit I mean I think that you know kind of a movie like Inception which is a great movie so I don't mean what I'm about to say next in a demeaning way but in terms of surrealism, Inception is kind of surrealism with training wheels on, right? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so you can kind of get, there's some similar concepts going on in Inception. Um, and then they're turned up to, to a thousand here in this yes. movie. Yes, yes. Okay, I can agree with that. Okay, where I think I can get you a little bit more is that I, I, I don't think David Lynch's movies, for the most part, Maybe with the exception of Inland Empire. But for the most part, his movies are not incoherent. Though they take time to puzzle out. His movies a lot of times are puzzles. Okay. So this movie is essentially, uh, in all of his movies, I think you can pin down with a fair degree of accuracy what they're actually about. Uh, and I think Eraserhead is fundamentally about the anxieties of, of impending fatherhood. Okay, so you... Uh, there's a few different ways people take this movie. You could look at it very darkly as though he kills his child and releases himself from the toils of fatherhood. That's where I was. Okay. Alright. The, the problem with that interpretation, which I think is very valid if you take this movie in isolation, but David Lynch's movies uh, build on each other and they tend to be in conversation with <laughs> one another in terms of symbols and themes and all of that. And that theme does not work for a David Lynch movie because uh, David Lynch operates in a very black and white mor morality, which is okay. surprising considering how fluid everything else is right. in his movies, but there's a very black and white morality. And this mo his movies sometimes end in a dark place, but Eraserhead doesn't. Like, it ends with him transcending to heaven, essentially, with the flash to white and the woman right. and the radiator and all of that. And so I think that rather than interpreting this as the literal experience of fatherhood, I think what's going on in this movie is essentially the anxiety about impending fatherhood. Is my child going to be a monster? Will I hate it? I mean, there's scenes in this movie that you, you I mean, you're a new parent for the second time. Right. Like, you've got, what, a, a three-month-old, four-month-old? Yeah, however old she is. However old she is. And so there's got to be moments in this movie that resonate on that level. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The crying baby in bed. That, shut right. up, shut up! Right. Like you don't have any answers, especially right, the right. first time around, right? Yeah. True. So the movie hits on a lot of that stuff. And I think it, it's really a sustained nightmare in terms of a man contemplating, uh, I just knocked up this woman, what happens next? Right. I'm not ready for this, and now I have to meet her parents, and I have to, you know, I'm going to get married to her, and then this is going to happen, and what's that going to mean? And then there's the temptation of infidelity, and am I just going to become a cog in the machine, which is the symbol of that kind of dream within the dream where he uh, is taken into the factory, right. which, which I just, I also find that very funny. The, okay, Paul, something about that line just cracks me up every single time. I, I don't know why. I don't know why. There's but no explanation. There's no explanation, but it's very funny, like right. the way that he says it. And so this is a movie that's essentially about the anxiety of becoming a father. All right. I can do that. Right. Um, 
so in terms of David Lynch's world, things like electricity, things like uh, heavy industrialism, uh, are all symbols of evil in a David Lynch world. Okay. So uh, sound is very important for David Lynch. Anytime you hear that crackling anxiety or electricity, right. uh, it's very much in an evil space in a David Lynch world. Interesting. So there's a lot of that that's going on here. Um, if you've seen Twin Peaks, speaking to the audience, because I know you have not, uh, you'll, you can kind of, uh, there, there's a symbol of the Black Lodge and the White Lodge, there's two different spaces inside of the Twin Peaks world, one being good, one being evil. Right. And David Lynch's movies essentially take place in either Black Lodge or White Lodge space, and this is very much a Black Lodge movie. Yes. Uh, with a escape to the White Lodge at the end of it. Which is part of why I don't take the movie in a literalist sense as far as it's about a man killing his child. Because it doesn't work. So yeah. then how do you accept that scene if you're talking about the anxieties of fatherhood? Well, it's not a real child. Like, it's uh, the child is a symbol for the anxieties of his sexuality and of his... Uh, uh, so that's the fatherhood. Yeah. Killing off his anxieties mm -hmm. and getting to a place of peace. Right. And so the man and the planet, then, the way I would read that, you know, it's very subjective, right. so it's not the only way you can read that, but the man and the planet is essentially an alternate version of himself, an evil version of himself, which is a doubling is a big deal in David Lynch movies. Okay. Uh, and he's pulling the levers and controlling his life, and so he's essentially, Henry's out of control, and the man on the planet is in control until at the very end, once the ultimate symbol of anxiety and fear has been killed, the man on the planet's now powerless, the planet breaks apart, and he can't do anything. Which is also why Henry, early on in the movie, because he, when he has not yet killed the symbol of anxiety, is not able to transcend when he meets the woman in the radiator. And the right. screen is flashing to white, and he can't quite do it, and then she disappears and is replaced by the man on the planet. What's the symbol with all like the little worm things? I think they're sperm. Well, that's kind of what I thought. Right. It's just weird that we would just leave them about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> Really, when you think about it, I mean, it's about fatherhood, right? I'm aware of how it works, yes. Yes. Okay, so if we take the opening sequence of this movie as a right. surrealist representation of him having sex. Right. And impregnating this woman. Right. It suddenly makes sense, right? Sure. You know, and so his sperm, on some level, becomes a symbol of anxiety, He's powerless to kill it. Like when he's chucking them against the wall, they don't burst apart. But right. when the woman in the radiator steps on him, because she's a White Lodge figure, uh, she's able to destroy them in a way that he's not. I, it's a weird movie. It's a weird movie. It's weird. Oh, <laughs> I don't know. I, I feel better with your explanation versus the way that I was going with it. So but that makes me feel more right. accepting of it. Yeah, I think part of what you have to do with surrealism, though, is you just kind of got to dive in head first. It's hard for me to do. I want to analyze. That's... Well, I, I mean, I, I like to analyze, too, but I think... Well, I th here's, a, here's the distinction in my mind, is that with surrealism, especially David Lynch-style surrealism, is there's a level of analysis you can achieve with the David Lynch movie, but then there's also there's stuff that you just kind of have to accept as it's just weird and it's random and we don't know what it means and, you know, you puzzle it out, but you can't quite put your finger on it. But why does it have to be weird? How come we can't have, like... A normal movie about the anxieties of impending fatherhood. Well, there probably, I mean, there are any number of normal movies about the anxieties. Well, I mean, of I mean, like father. he could have done this movie with, I don't know, like what? What's the point of the weird stuff? Is it just like? Well, I think the weirder stuff, like surrealism, hits us on a subconscious level, right? That that maybe, um, you know, Meet the Parents, right, would maybe be a similar thematics 
uh, movie in terms of thematic space it exists in, um, but it's very on the nose, and so I think that the surrealist uh, subconscious nature can kind of get under our skin in a way that Meet the Parents can't. You feel more invested in the surrealist one? Or? I don't think it's about investment so much as I think it's that I think we we absorb art on a conscious and subconscious level and David Lynch is a very subconscious director. Right? Right. It's like, yes. Yes, 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 yes he is. We will definitely agree with that. So yeah. you're saying it's more just uh, you you have more experience with looking at and thinking about movies at a subconscious level and I do not and so that's why it doesn't quite fit with me yet. Yeah, but it also could be just something that doesn't fit with you. I mean, I think that, you know, I mean, you've heard me, we've talked before uh, about objective and subjectivism in terms right. of movies and I don't think art is subjective because I think that there is such a thing as beauty and I think there is such a thing as truth and that art is about truth and it's about beauty and that those are real things right. and not real in just one way and so it's complicated of course but I don't buy that that art is is entirely subjective so that uh, you know Ace Ventura pet detective is just as valid a, a piece of art as Hamlet like I don't buy that right. but the flip side to that <clears throat> in the way that I think about it is that your experience of art is very subjective and when it comes to surrealism in particular or something like this uh, something like David Lynch um, I think you can train yourself to be more open to that stuff but right. at the end of the day it either hits you or it doesn't sure right uh, it, it's that it does exist at such a subconscious level and so there might be things with you where because you haven't watched this type of movie so much that that you're reaching for meaning and, and rather than just kind of embracing the experience and right. that might be something you can kind of train yourself in right. but at the end of the day you could, it's possible that you could do that and get yourself to a point where you totally appreciate why people appreciate this movie but it never hits you right. in the right way that seems fair I can do that yeah I can get behind that right I'm just glad that it did not turn out to just be total... You were worried in that opening five minutes. Yeah, I was quite worried. Especially yeah. when the first word was like ten minutes into the movie. And I was like, oh boy. And it was like an awkward conversation. And I was like, uh... There really weren't too many words, though. There, there are two movies that begin like this. Where I had the same reaction to, to both of them. That one of them was Eraserhead, and the other one is Ingmar Bergman's Persona, uh, which is a top ten movie for me of all time. And and both of them kind of exist similarly, where they go on to a plot of sorts, um, but kind of a surrealist plot. But then they have an ultra surrealist opening ten minutes. Right. And in both cases, I kind of I remember thinking the first time I watched both movies. If this is it for the next hour and a half, I'm good. Like, like there's just something See. here that's hitting me in just the right way that I'm good. Good for you. But there are other movies that begin like that where that's not the case. Right. Uh, okay. So I reach behind you here. So this is out one. It is a 14-hour French movie. Oh, and the first hour or two are just actors rehearsing a play. And that did not hit me in the same way. It did not? It did not. <laughs> that probably hit me better. No, you, you, trust me. They're not just like, it's, it's, it, they're not rehearsing a play in a coherent sense. Like they're doing rehearsal exercises, so they're kind of just in a circle grunting at each other. And it goes on on and on. I think that might hit me better. <laughs> it's like two hours. But, uh, I mean, I, I wound up loving the movie when it was all said and done. But those, those first couple hours, man, those were rough. Yes. And it, it was not hitting me in the right way at all. And so it's, it's a, you know, it varies. And there's artists that hit me in the, that way. And there's artists that right. I think 
what you train yourself on is to be open to that type of experience, but that it, also recognizing that it is so subjective with that style of movie making in terms of whether or not it's going to work for you. Right. Okay. So I'm guessing that um, you're not quite ready to go on to another David Lynch. You, you don't no, want to I'm watch. Gonna be, we're going to need to take a break. Eventually, I think I want to show you my all and drive. That's fair. But not for a while. Uh, I think where we're going to go next, I'll give you two options. I'll give you two options. Um, we can either watch my third favorite movie of all time, which is a silent film. If you're ready for a silent film. Called I do a silent film. Passion of Joan of Arc. Or we can watch uh, Werner Herzog's Gear of the Wrath of God. Both of them are just phenomenal. They both sound great to me. Okay, well, we'll see. Uh, criterion the subtitled? Uh, the, the, the silent film? No, the... Uh, Agira? Yeah. Uh, no, it's a, it's in English. It's a German movie. That's what, yeah. Okay. But it's... Uh, so there's an interesting little, little history with Agira in terms of that because they had actors of all different languages on set. And so at the time it was made it was a, a fairly common practice especially in some european films to redub your movies afterwards sure. so the plan had been we're all just going to record in english uh, because that's the language everybody spoke and then we'll redub in german right um and there is a german edition of it but the main actor klaus kinski who is psychotic in the most literal sense of the term good there's so many great stories of klaus kinski he and Werner Herzog made four movies together and at, at various times they were each planning to kill each other in totally serious. Like they, they, <laughs> they were planning to kill each other. Great. Uh, so Klaus Kinski decided he didn't want to uh, come back to redub his dialogue and so the actor who uh, you hear in the German version is not Klaus Kinski, which he has a very distinctive voice, so it's unfortunate. Uh, so I recommend watching the English version is is what we will do when we right. watch that one okay um but yeah and then uh the passion of joan of arc is, is subtitled as well they're both great movies right. so we'll see which one we wind up watching so any final thoughts on eraserhead uh, you want to borrow it and rewatch it I, you know what? good you're good on that uh i think with your explanation i feel better about it than i did um it's still really weird <laughs> um, still not. Well, yeah, right. of course it's weird. I know. That's part of what I love about it. Well, we jumped from where were we last time? We were. What did we watch? Like Pass of we Glory. Were, yeah. We, watched Pass of Glory. we jumped from that to this. That's. But we also talked about Eyes Wide Shut, which is surrealist in its own way. But a more. I can get behind that. Like, there's. Right. Okay. It's a, it's a very different breed of uh, surrealism. I think what we learned tonight is that I enjoy a consistent plot with very little holes. Well, I don't know if I'd quite agree that there are plot holes. Plot holes are mistakes. There aren't mistakes in this movie. It's, subcon it's subconscious, uh, un kind of an unfiltered expression of the subconscious, sure. which is different than plot holes. Now, I think what you mean is that there are things that don't connect. Right. And that's 100% true, but I wouldn't call them plot holes. What would you call it? Things that don't connect? There's yeah. got to be a word for it, though. Um, I, would, I would call it, uh, I don't know what I would call it. Uh, right. Subconscious. Uh, we'll come up with it. Yeah. Get a couple more of these in our system, we'll come I, up with a no, word. This is too expensive. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Notice how slow we're sipping. Yeah, you, you yeah. can't chug these. No, you cannot. you got to enjoy every sip. You're right, but no, so Racerhead's a classic movie. This is, I think it's in the site like, sound top 250. Uh, it's definitely considered one of the great movies of all time. So you can chalk, uh, check that one off your list. Uh, yeah, thank goodness. All right. All right. So we'll be back with either a gear or a passion of the Joan of Arc in a month or so. Uh, but for now, I'm Ben Bono. I'm Ben Kirkwell. And this is Sci-Fi Christian. Goodbye.